there was interest. That's good. That's great. I think there's a lot of reason for um, scientists to, or, or medical doctors, to be interested in science. And, and part of it is exactly what you said, Ariana, that in, in many ways, medicine itself lends itself to scientific inquiry. Could you sign in and then also take some paper? Um, and part of that is because, you know, when we think about it, none of the, none of the treatments that we have is ideal for our patients. So we're always trying to improve, you know, improve on, on our care. And science provides a method to test ideas and obtain evidence for best patient management. And we cannot experiment on patients, and I'll, I'll be driving this home, but several times, but if as, as soon as you think, gosh, maybe we should look at that and study it, you need to like think about getting uh, institutional review board approval, okay? It's okay to do that, but, but you know, we just, we, we always don't ever say, well, you know, we only have three patients. Let's just see what happens. Once you have that question, then you should be thinking about getting IRB approval, so human subjects approval. And, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done in scientific inquiry. And we're going to go through some of the different types today, too. Um, but I want to I wanna talk about, um, I, I'm one of those people that likes to believe that every physician is a clinician scientist of sorts. Like, there are different ways that we can uh, add to the whole, um, to the process. And, you know, we, we already know that science and medicine are so linked, and we do practice evidence-based medicine. So we don't just experiment on patients, we actually go with what's the best approach based on clinical trial evidence. And when we don't have that evidence, then we disclose what we do know to the patient in informed consent. So, you know, sometimes we use an off-label drug. For example, Acular, right? Ketorolac. We use that for cystoid macular edema after cataract surgery. But it's not FDA approved for that. So that actually requires you to talk to your patient and say, listen, we have a drug that there have been clinical trials or clinical studies that have shown evidence. It's not real strong evidence, probably because there will never be enough patients to be able to to do a really strong, uh, accurate, adequately powered study. But nonetheless, you have evidence and you want to do something to help your patient. So that would be an example where we use this kind of, we do this every day when we see patients. So reasons to approach medicine scientifically to make a difference, to provide better treatment and care for patients, to be at the cutting edge you know, of what's the best thing we can do for, for patients and health. But we could also do it to evaluate manuscripts critically. You know, when you're reading the literature and you're wondering, well, I don't know how strong this evidence is. You, by, by having some uh, background as a clinician scientist, you could evaluate the manuscripts more critically. And you can also uh, meet a need that's unmet, like better quality of life for patients, healthcare workers, physicians. It can be local, it can be global. You can see that there's a problem in the world that you want to make better based on what you already know in locally, for example. It can be in education, patient education and literacy um, and communication, and it can be in public health. That's sort of an altruistic, those are altruistic reasons to be a, sci a clinician scientist. But there are also other reasons. When you're, depending on how much you get into science, there's a certain group a network of people that you meet. Like, for example, one of my, um, one of, I'm in National Eye Institute Council now. So I advise the director of the NER. And that brings together a number of other clinician scientists and scientists. And, and that's like a group of friends, you know, that we have a similar way that we think of things. So collegiality, increased knowledge in our discipline and with other non medical disciplines curiosity to understand more than is known, travel to see other medical practices, we can see how others do, and that's sort of fun. And this is another reason, 
Actually, we all know that going through medical school is um, an internship and residency. And then when you get to fellowship, it's even harder. Um, so they, you know, you're, you're constantly pushing and uh, you're always uh, doing your best for your patients. So it keeps you busy throughout that, those age 20s. And, um, and it keeps you busy through your 90s. And it leads to passion and fulfillment. And that's sort of healthy reasons to be a clinician scientist. So anyway, we're going to start out with what a hypothesis is. So um, Becca, what's a hypothesis? So um, you have a um, thought or idea about um, how uh, one thing leads to another in a scientific setting or how think something happens and you want to ultimately test that hypothesis. So it needs to be something that's based in either evidence or based in um, anecdotal uh, support. Okay, that's pretty close. So it's basically a question based on observations in nature, and that's key, in nature. So it's not like, gosh, I wonder what happens in this model. You know, I've got this interesting animal model with, that has a genetic knockout, say, and I really want to find out what happens to it. That's not really a hypothesis, that's a name. The hypothesis is my patient, I wonder why, uh, you know, my, I wonder why this disease causes X, Y, Z. That could, it could be that simple as a hypothesis. And it can be posed as a statement, and this is what Becca was saying, and that you plan to test it. So you can start out very general. You know, why, uh, why does a vein occlusion, why does a central retinal vein occlusion cause blood vessels to grow in the iris? I mean, isn't that sort of unusual? You know, why does that happen? So it could be a general question. And then once the question is posed, then there are next steps. So this is where you become the investigator, right? So research the literature, find out, you know, how do you do that? Um, you know, I do it, I initially, if it, it sort of depends. If it's a question that I know nothing about, like for example, I got recently interested in uh, Schlem canal cells because they have, I'm a, I, I study angiogenesis and blood vessel growth and they have, they, they kind of are like endothelial cells, sort of, but they're not quite. And so I wanted to understand this whole issue of, of why do patients develop uh, glaucoma, and is it related to certain growth factors, say, in the eye? And so uh, I didn't know anything about schlunk, <laughs> you know, trabecular meshwork cells, I didn't know. So I actually started through Google. And um, it's, you know, Google has its benefit, at least it can, you know, it's not up to date, you know, you get everything out there. But sometimes it at least gives you some starters to be able to then do a more refined search through PubMed, or you can go through the library, as we saw in Grand Rounds, and go through the librarians. Also asking colleagues for their experience, um, and I will also put in their mentors, like if you have a mentor who works in the area, definitely talk with them, and then be aware of patients' thoughts, too, about the condition. Like if you're interested in glaucoma, whatever, and Sometimes we're trained to that this is the way you do it uh, in medicine, and this is how it happens, and yet that's not always, that's a hypothesis, but we're not taught that as um, medical uh, students and, and residents and fellows. We're taught that, uh, that, that that's, that's gospel, but it may just be hypothesis. So sometimes you, you can get information from your patients as well. It's incremental learning. So you get, first you have to do that background, you learn, then um, you, can, you can then, as you're, as you're gathering information and you may find out that there's very little on it, you have to be also aware of bias. And what I mean by that is if you get a bunch of case series, you know, an example would be, in, you know, uh, somebody tests, well, let's see what happens when we give a steroid injection in the eye in somebody with macular edema from vein occlusion. So we're gonna take 10 patients, we give them a steroid, and we see what happens. 
and they find out, oh my gosh, in a month they're better, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that steroids, uh, you know, that's not really testing a hypothesis. Are steroids helping macular edema? You have to, you have to be able to, to go further and delve further into this. Um, so, and that's the anecdotal findings. Um, yes. The other thing to think about when you're doing a hypothesis, like when you're designing your study, is is it possible? Like if you, you have this great idea like, oh, let's see what happens if um, we follow patients who have uh, glaucoma and we want to see what happens to their visual field and compare it to, say, their optic nerve findings or their nerve fiber layer on OCT. Well, it, it may be something that takes, you, you know, thousands of patients to be able to find a difference. So it's helpful in those cases to um, meet with a biostatistician and to be able to break down your question. You may need to make it more possible, or you may need to collaborate with others in a multi-center trial. Okay, so that's sort of a general thing about hypothesis, and I want you all now to write down a question of uh, a hypothesis that you want to do. And let me see if there's paper for you guys. So you've got a, I think most of you have hypothesis. You need a little more time. Anyway, the next part you can think about is how are you going to test it, okay? So how do you test your hypothesis? And what I'll start by saying is it kind of depends on the area of science. If it's clinical, then there, we have, we don't have as, it's much harder to get really strong evidence, right? In clinical, we can't experiment on patients. The best we can do is maybe a clinical trial to test if something works compared to a control. But um, so it, it depends on that. And, and it, I think it's important to break the question down. So that's paid based on literature search as I said in your initial research, but also work with mentors and determine if it's, you know, your mentors may be based on whether it's basic science or, or clinical. And many times you need mentors in both realms. And if it's developed, you know, does it involve lots of patients? Is it something where you're gonna need like a population-based study? And then in that case, and I would say probably in every case, it's helpful to get biostatistician. So, so, um, you know, let, let's just go around the room. Let, let me hear some of the hypotheses that people have developed. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, how effective are contact precautions at preventing the actual transmission of clinically significant disease in a hospital? 
Oh, that's a good question. When I'm sweating and in a full <laughs> gown and everything, that's like the first question that always comes to my head. So, so that's a good that's a good question. That's a very good question. So and so that's probably clinical, right? And uh, so it would have to be so let's see how you would do that. How do you and so you know think about some of the ways that you could actually test that hypothesis. What would you what would be your experimental what would be the experiment? So think of it that way. Like can you can you have contact precautions and not contact precautions, right. or could you test between two different types of contact precautions, for example? Those might be some of the things to think about. Um, because if you just if you just say, well, let's just see how people do when we do this implementation, you're not, you don't have really a, a, a control group. But that's a good question, and think about that. So continue to work on that. And maybe the infectious dis infection are those people, the infection control police, <laughs> or whatever, you know, or infectious disease may, may also be able to give you guidance. So that's good. I like that. Teresa? So mine was, does refractive error affect learning in Navajo school-age children? So um, I thought about this because, so um, Navajo, um, like younger uh, children tend to have high degrees of astigmatism. Yes. And, like, um, so we know that there's it's kind of a resource poor area. And so that's why we go down with like outreach and try and provide glasses. And so I was wondering if you could correlate like having glasses or not having glasses to like being able to learn in school. So your question is actually it is it is it valuable to correct refractive error for teaching and how or for learning, for learning, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you then that's good. How would you learn um, how would you test the outcome of learning, for okay. example? So, I mean, you could see kind of where their grades are at in school if you had access to it. Or, um, I feel like my mom's a teacher and she always can tell me, she's like, I know which kids are having trouble learning and which ones aren't. So work with teachers. I think that's very good, yeah. And, and, and actually, ask teachers, well, what kind of outcome would you look at, right? I think that that's very good. Um, and, and how long, you know, the other thing to think about when you're doing designing your hypothesis and studies is think about how long it would take, right? How long would it take to do this study? So you may want to say, I'm going to give it a certain time period, like six months or something. And so you want to get then an outcome measure that you think you could actually find a difference in that period of time. And so that's where teachers and, and uh, educators can also be valuable because they, they, they look at those outcomes. I think that's great. Good, good. What, what uh, did you find? Uh, my question would be, what is the difference in outcome in varying levels of aggressive versus conservative treatment of a small carotid dissection? So of a small carotid dissection? And you, so, and your, your was, what are the differences in outcomes between? Between a more aggressive approach versus conservative. Um, and so, and, and so what would your more aggressive approach be? Um, Wait, a dardorectomy or something? Versus or approach or versus, yeah. I don't know. Um, I suppose, and then conservative would be medical, versus, yeah, medical or just observation. Just okay. Versus so, okay. So one approach um, could be just to retrospectively look right into the data. So you find <coughs> the data, you know, assuming that patients have conservative versus more aggressive approaches, right, and define that. And you could sort of do a case control kind of study and be able to, to determine that. Again, working with a biostatistician, that gives you the evidence to see whether or not it's you know, worthwhile to proceed with a prospective study, right? So, so that, would be, that would be very good. And I'm sure that, um, and that's a very good question, and I, I'm sure that other people who understand that area more than I do would be able to to work with you and help you refine the question and maybe the approach. So I gave you one example, but they may say, oh, no, we have retrospective studies already, so let's go right to a prospective study. It's good. Thank you. What, what was your question? Uh, my question was, will iris neovascularization develop if all the posterior angiogenic factors are blocked? Okay. 
All right, so that's a good study. So how, so first of all, so think of a couple things with that, because you may refine it. Um, how are you going to determine what all the angiogenic factors are? I think that we probably don't know, but could narrow it down. Okay, that's good. One or two. Yeah, and if you were going to narrow it down, is there one that you would, or two, that you would really? Jeff and HIF, what? Well, HIF, yeah, HIF, so, so this is good. This is where going through the literature is good because HIF is a transcription factor that can be stabilized. It's usually not secreted in, like, in the vitreous. So, but VEGF is. So you could potentially, you know, based on the studies done, be able to say, is VEGF, um, you know, a, a, is VEGF affected in patients? We know it is, right? And then... If you want, were you thinking it's experimental, um, or were you thinking? I think this would have to be clinical. I think mean, this would have to be animal. Okay, animals. good. And what kind of like? Do you have an idea of a model? Yeah. Well, this came up because um, <coughs> a patient with iris neovascularization, um, and clinically considering whether. PRP will kind of solve that problem. Uh huh. Um, so, what I imagine, and I don't know if this exists, would be say a diabetic retinopathy animal model who your test group gets maybe like total PRP in the back or like laser out the whole back, um, and you'd have to measure. Um, VEGF levels that are still secreted, uh, and then measure iris neovascularization. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest another model. I think it's a good question. I would start with animal, and I would look in the literature because in the past, like there there have been studies where they use rose. I don't know if it's rose bengal. They use various types of dye and then would uh, laser all the vessels around the optic nerve. And I think they used pig models, but there were other animal models as well. And that induced neovascularization. So if you can find a mouse model, you might be able to, there's not, a, you can't knock out HIF or, but there are ways that you can affect the expression of HIF. And you can look at those genetic models and then really test you know, the effect on iris neovascularization. You could also use drugs that stabilize <coughs> HIF or inhibit HIF, right, if, if, if that's a concern. So that may be an approach. And the reason that I'm, I'm suggesting that, and, and I, I also say I, I don't totally understand, so, you know, don't get discouraged, talk to other people too, but the reason I'm suggesting that is that there's so much variability in how patients present with neovascularization and who presents and there isn't we don't see that much now so it may actually be very difficult to get the patient population and maybe not even ethically possible anymore right with because we use anti-VEGF and that so so the study becomes harder but but you know I encourage you to to look at some of the models and to work on that I think that 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 that's that's a very good question Becca, what did you get? Um, so um, I was wondering if a uh, teleretinal screening program uh, could improve visual outcomes in patients with diabetes, um, especially patients with limited resources. I know there's a lot of work been, that's been put into developing these teleretinal models, but I don't know as much about you know what's been done on the other end as far as are we actually improving outcomes. Oh, yeah. improving and outcomes. so I think that would be interesting. could start as retrospective looking into the models that are out there and seeing if they're actually doing anything good. And then if they are, then do a, build a prospective model where we're actually, actually actively you know, getting the same measures before and after screening. Okay, good. That's a good question. And are you thinking maybe even population-based? Yeah, population-based. Yeah. So that would be something, I mean, like if you were here, we have a whole population, right, uh, um, department. So Rachel Hess and... Um, Angie Fagerly, and so a number of people can help yeah, me so with Tom Green and all that. Building can, all the cohorts that you want to. Exactly. Use. And that probably would, 
would be something collaborative as well. Um, and there, uh, so I think that, yeah, so that's very good, and that's a very, that's kind of, dip, you know, we're getting a variety. This is great. How about your question? What did you come up with? Um, <coughs> I guess my overall question, uh, what, what, what causes uh, macular degeneration in some people, but not others? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's been looked at a lot, um, but um, one thing I was wondering was whether, like, whether NAD plus, which is uh, been so like a uh, um, has been associated with um, uh, other signs of aging and neurodegenerative diseases. So uh -huh. I would be interested in if that was decreased in uh, patients with macular degeneration compared to the age matched population. It's very interesting. And so, how would you measure NAD plus in the in the patients that you have? Um, so I think classically they do it. Um, they've done an animal model, so they looked at levels of tissues. But I believe it can uh, also be measured in blood. So if okay. they're human, they would be considered. And is it does it correlate with like if you measure in blood, does it is it the same as what it would be in the tissue in the eye? Um, that I'm not sure. Yeah. So yeah. it may. So let's see. And and do you have to measure it in live people, or could you look at eye bank guys just to you get a sense? Probably look at eye bank guys. Yeah. Because uh -huh. they usually measure it uh, post mortem. So yeah. And, and you're looking at the protein, is that right? Or the enzyme activity, or? Um, I guess it's the molecule. That, okay. Uh, it's the molecule that's not yeah, that, so if that's of real interest, um, so, so like if you're looking at activities and you have these enzymes that do things really quickly, sometimes it's hard to catch them at the right time, but um, I mean, one way is to look at a downstream product from the enzymatic reaction. Um, and if you're looking at expression, you could also look at genes or mRNA, and that might be something to talk to Greg Hageman about, like if you if you had interest in that. So I would encourage you to continue to look in the in the literature on that and, and um, think more about that. But I think that's very interesting. I like that. Okay, Chris, what did you? Um, so my question is, uh, in people who are wind musicians, are there higher rates of glaucoma, and should we be thinking about pre-treating these people? Because we know that we know That's that a really good idea. We know that people with you know play wind instruments. I'm a trumpet player myself, but we have there's higher you know when you're playing there's you have increased in, you have increased uh, intraocular pressure. Yeah. But you know is that significant? And over time, you know, is there a cumulative effect that, that can lead to glaucoma damage? And wow. Should we be treating yeah. People? That is That's reason. That's a really neat question. How are you? How are you gonna? How are you gonna start? Is there any evidence <laughs> out there? No, I think it's really important. I mean, you know the studies. I mean, look at Bob Weinreb. He has the whole sleep study, right? That people who are lying flat have higher incidence of glaucoma, I think. But I mean, he does. He has a whole lab where he has people like sleeping and not sleeping and all that. So, and it started from an observation. I think this is interesting. So, I mean, there's there's been a lot of work done that shows that you know. Playing when instruments increase your intracular pressure, and and um, I don't know. This has just kind of popped in my head. I was thinking about it over the past couple of days, actually. But I don't know if there's a lot of evidence. I've done research research to see if there's been people looking at glaucoma damage over time. But um, that'd be the next step. And something like this, you know, I I think you might have to start doing a retrospective review. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, you're talking about years of playing and cumulative. Yeah. So it'd be hard to do that prospectively. Yeah. So let me just give you throw this out if you're interested in it. So in I don't know if it still exists. So this was pre-Katrina, I was at LSU. And they used to have a musician's clean, clinic, eye clinic, and it was free. So it was for, you know, like Wynton Marsalis and a lot of different jazz musicians who, you know, you know they're, they're like incredible, uh, they're incredible, right, with their music. They're celebrities, but many times they don't make a lot of money and they don't have insurance and their health care isn't that great. So we had a free clinic for them at LSU. And so you might be able to find different clusters where you could take, say, you could, you could just, I mean, just get some evidence to even help to support the hypothesis. Um, and, you know, look at people who have been playing, maybe, limp, you know, say you have to be playing this amount of time or something. Maybe you want to found, find any confounding factors that might, you know, that, that you might want to look at as well. And then have a control group, right, and compare. So, that's very interesting. I like that. What did you come up with? I said, 
what is the rate of candidal endophthalmitis and chorioretinitis in patients with systemic candidemia without vi visual complaints? And what about in patients who are unable to describe visual symptoms? Okay, so what was the first part? What is the... Oh, what is the rate of candidal endophthalmitis? Okay. So this sounds like uh, like an important question for, because residents get all those consults, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so there is some evidence in the literature, right? People have published on that, and you probably, are, are you aware of some of that? Yeah. Some of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how would you design your study? I think it's, it's good. So we have, a, we have enough volume for it. Um, it would be something where there's like a humming here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so for people who have uh, candida or other fungus, we could do both. Um, in the blood, they have an ophthalmology consult, they get a dilated examination. Uh, we would have to document each one whether or not they were able to provide symptoms or not able to provide symptoms, and if they were, if they had visual complaints or not. And then um, I think we're kind of new at seeing the fungus, and so it might take like fungus photography of each patient, like a cell phone camera kind of thing oh, yeah. of the fungus, and then have it looked at in terms of does the resident think there's anything there, and then does the retina fellow who's staffing it think there's anything there, and see over the course of like two years worth of consults on these things, um, how many people actually had uh, disease that warranted treatment, and were any of them endophthalmitis or chorioretinitis. Okay. So it would be your seeing this perspective, for sure, right? It's just more like a series, which is fine, a prospective series, and then when you get your, you'll you'll end up with your cohorts, I guess, ones who did, and, or ones who did, had candidate findings, ones who didn't, and then you could compare them, potentially, because maybe you could find risk factors, right, that, well, when you have X, Y, Z, now, that's a big study, I mean, it, it's probably going to take a lot, but if you did, you might find that if they have these parameters, we found that they were more likely to have. So I think that's really good. Um, the other thing I would just have you think about, too, because I don't know that anyone's done work in it, but is there like a biomarker that could be measured that is associated with infection with candida? You know what I mean? Not doing PCR on aqueous say, on every patient because that's a little invasive, but you know, is there something that you might be able to find? So very good and very important, right? You know, because of manpower and Sure. Yeah, so this actually came up yesterday after Mammoth's path rounds, but so two questions. What is the effect on endothelial cell count in deep treatment of corneal cross-linking? Oh, okay, so so that's kind of, yeah, okay, so what is the effect on endothelial cell count after deep-linking cross-linking? So, and then okay. the second question would be, what effect on tensile strength does deep corneal cross-linking have on graphs such as DSEC? Okay, so do you have like a broader, is, so what, what, uh, What question am I trying to figure out? Well, yeah, what was the, what was the overall, does deep, does so, deep linking do something to the vision potential? Yeah. yeah, so basically, if you could strengthen either a PK or a DSEC or a DMEG through corneal cross-linking, then you'd have a, therapeutic benefit for patients. So basically my, I guess my big picture question yeah. is, can we strengthen these graphs through cross-linking like we do for catacombs? Okay, patients? so even even bigger, like <laughs> going up, sure. right, is it that we want to figure out a way to reduce the graph failure or the long-term graph failure or something mm -hmm. like that? And then your aims would be, let's test whether or not this effect has an impact. Um, th that's great. I think that's a really... And that, that could be doable. Now, what would be your comparison? So you have the deep versus just... They're just standard. Um, and I was looking up a little bit yesterday. You can measure how deep your treatment is through excision of tissue, and then there's a demarcation line. But they've also recently done, like, confocal microscopy, uh -huh. so you can do it in vivo. Yeah. So you'd have to have an animal model, basically, where you treated um, standard depth and then where you went deeper, closer to the endothelium. Um, you probably have to do some testing to see how deep you are and kind of your um, like standard deviation of your treatment depth. Yeah, okay, good. And it sounds like you could do this with mammals, right? And so I think that's great. And you could do the animal model. They have a way of doing the cross-link and everything. Are, and probably rabbits? Is 
that would Rabbits be. Rabbits would probably be where you're at. Yeah, because they, they're, they're corneas. Is that right? Their corneas are kind of like some virus or Ish, yeah. Ish, but more than, and they're a little easier than mice. Yes. Like that. Yeah, Very good. Anyways, so. I like that. Good luck. And Thanks. what did what did you? Um, well, something I've been talking to a number of people about recently is <laughs> what is the relative efficacy of trabeculectomy versus various mixed devices for control of IOP and disease progression in glaucoma patients? Okay. Okay, so that's good. And that seems like, that, so that kind of lends itself to a comparison like retrospective case control type of study, possibly. But do, I guess the questions that, that you might think of going for it, you know, it's when we think about the clinical studies and we're comparing them, it's really good to compare to be age match, gender match, but also sort of time match. Do you know what I mean? Time in medicine. Like it, it, if you're saying if you're taking historical data and comparing it to, to data now, there may have been things back then that are very different than what we do now. Sure. It just seems like I've been talking with a lot of people. It seems like. There's sort of a, I was talking with Dr. Roscoe about this yesterday, but there's almost a push from some people to go back towards trabeculectomy and tube shunt devices, and, um, and there, there's some ongoing studies actually testing some newer mixed devices and versus trabeculectomy, but really in order to get good data, it seems like it would have to be prospective, and that might be difficult to actually do and get IRB approval for. Okay. Well, I think with Dr. Wairosko, you've got a great mentor there. Yeah. yeah she's, she's very scientifically oriented, and she'd be able to work on, you know, ways to be able to test that. So I encourage you to, to continue to do that. I think that's really good. Um, so that was great. I mean, you guys all have great questions, so you've got this down. Um, you know, I, I'm going to kind of skip through. I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, each year it's a little different, and I never know the interest level, but it seems like I've got, like, a really interested group. This is great. So I'm kind of going to skip through some of the other information kind of quickly because I think you may know this. So, um, okay, so what's going on here? Let me just see if I can figure out what happened. PRK increases the performance of interns in ophthalmology because Sean just got PRK two weeks ago, a week ago. So. You know, that, that's for sure. It doesn't appear to. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does not. <laughs> Initial results. <laughs> yeah. Initial results, not helpful. So, what we said, that might be anecdotal. So, I'm just going to briefly go through, you know, these are, these are all good. So, I kind of said you couldn't be mechanistic as much in clinical, and that's because ethically we can't experiment on patients. We can do clinical trials. But we want to have a lot of evidence going forward with that before we do it. So the exploratory or hypothesis generating is fine. And that would be something where a case control study, right? You refine your hypothesis. You get evidence to be able to under understand that. And it's always good to go to a biostatistician so you don't get, you know, when we're scientists, we want our hypothesis to be true. But the most exciting thing is if you get information that actually goes against your hypothesis because then it makes you rethink and go deeper into what might be going on. So, and then the mechanistic studies are where you actually test the hypothesis. So that, and um, let me see if I, uh, so an example of that would be, you know, say for example, uh, uh, let me think, what would be an example of a mechanistic study? Say we want to know whether VEGF signaling through VEGF receptor 2 uh, is, important in uh, blood vessel growth into the vitreous in a model, okay? So what we would do in that case is we would try to inhibit VEGF receptor 2. So first, you know, you might first just look. Okay, if we give VEGF, we measure, and this is an animal model, we give VEGF, we measure VEGF receptor 2. So VEGF could be given by ischemia. You increase the expression. You measure it in the animal model, make sure it's increased, make sure the receptor is activated, and you look for the outcome, right? Blood vessels into the vitreous. But then to test a hypothesis, you have to knock out or knock down 
or reduce the FEGF receptor 2 activation and then see the outcome. That's how you test it. Now, you can't do that in person, right? But you can do it in an animal model or in cells. And there are various ways you could do it pharmacologically. You can use receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You can do it by gene therapy and introducing a short hairpin RNA to VEGF receptor 2 and thereby reducing that. So there are different ways like that. So that would be more of a mechanistic study. And this is, a, so this is what, um, this is a little bit of that ethics I wanted to go through. You know, there are differences in medical <laughs> questions and science inquiry. In, and, and also just in science rigor. So in medicine, we're trained to, to observe outcomes based on intervention, like how a patient does when we give them antibiotics. You know, I just had antibiotics for pneumonia, but I probably had viral pneumonia, and the reason they gave me antibiotics is they can't distinguish viral and bacterial more than 30% of the time. So it's like I'm not going to wait around and get worse and say, oh, it's, I guess it's bacterial. You know what I mean? So. You, you do things like that, but in science, we have to really be rigorous and test our observations. So in a model, if you were trying to figure out is it bacterial or viral, you might actually wait till the outcome happened and see what the effect is. You can't do that in patients. And, and uh, when you do the, when you test the hypothesis and you're really rigorous about it, especially in basic science or in you know, translational research, Science always says exploration is part of it, but you still want the rigor of testing the hypothesis. So let me see. I want to spend a little time on mentors. And um, so, you know, exploratory research, it can be qualitative studies like assessing barriers to diabetic eye care from, you know, from focus groups, maybe a little bit of the telemedicine approach. That's a little bit of an outcome study. Adherence, compliance, OC feet. CT features associated. So association studies are really kind of exploratory. They're not really testing anything. You see, is uh, reduced easy line associated with worse division after retinal attachment repair, you know, in a macula off detachment. So it doesn't prove anything, right? It just gives you evidence to support it. Um, exploratory research in basic science could be metabolomics, you know, amino acid localization, genetic association studies, even when you have genetic association studies and they say this gene variant is associated with AMD versus people without AMD. It's an association. It's not, not causal. Whereas in mechanistic studies, you know, again, you're not really doing mechanism with clinical trials even. You're doing either the, the medicine versus placebo or the medicine versus comparison and, and to an outcome. But you're not necessarily looking at how that medicine affects the disease. But you are at least, that's a gold standard that's, that's important. And maybe beyond that is um, a meta-analysis of a number of clinical trials to see how generalizable the, the findings are. But in basic science, you can actually test a hypothesis. And then in population research, I'm not even going to go into this. I think if you do want population research, talk to someone who knows more than I do. <laughs> OK, so mentorship. I do want to touch a little bit on mentors. Um, how do you get involved in research? Find someone that you, that you sort of like. I mean, you can have multiple mentors at different times in your life. You like how they do things or what they're doing. You want to learn more about them. Uh, they might have an area of interest that you have a mutual, you know, mutual benefit like in cornea, you know, and, um, and cross-linking with mammalists. Make sure it's feasible. So you, if you meet with somebody and you say, I want to do a project, and they say, oh, great. Well, I've got this five-year study that's going on, and I want you to do something in it and be involved. I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's fine, but there are questions you can ask, like, you know, I want to be involved throughout it. Can I take a little bit of it because I'm only here for two years? Also, be realistic. If you go in and say, I've got two months off, I want to do a research project. It's, it's probably unlikely that you're going to be able to complete a research project in two months. But you can get started, and that's not a reason not to do it. It's just, you know, these are questions to think about. So, um, you know, 
follow your gut and your soul. The initial question you have, I, like my first was, well, my first research was in cancer, but when I was in ophthalmology, my first research was in RK healing of the cornea. So totally different. I ended up in retina, but the it it, it was the research process. It was that discovery. It was finding things out. It was being involved in the actual uh, experiments that really hooked me. And actually, I was hooked in high school. So it wasn't. It was more like how do I get involved in ophthalmology to be able to do research when I started out wanting to do cancer research. So how did I make that transition? So you follow your gut and your soul, but you know it's going to come a time when you're at a point that you can say, okay, I'm ready to do the research. And there are going to be questions that just drive you. And they may be from your patients. They're, they're going to be what drives your passion. So don't worry if that doesn't happen right away. It will, it will happen. And um, anyway, but you know, that, that's how you would get started. So mentors are multiple throughout your life. They can be more or less prominent during different phases of your career, and that's okay. You can be really involved with someone in residency, and then you go to your fellowship, and you're not really, really as much involved. And they may come back later on. That certainly has happened to me. Trust is essential. So you want someone that you believe you can talk to. And if you're, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen where you have an idea, and you talk to somebody, and you say, I really want to work in your lab. And that person says, I'm sorry, I don't have space for you. And then they take your idea. I mean, it's not that common here. It happened to me in Boston, but it's not, I don't think it's that common, but you want to make sure that the person that you're talking to, you trust. And most of the time, I, th I think like in Utah, I don't think, I think you can trust people. Um, so if you're an MD and you're working with PhDs, that's great, but I would also encourage you to have an MD as a mentor. So you can have a mentoring team, but the reason I say that is as an MD, you're going to have clinical responsibilities. And it's very helpful to work with an MD who has figured out how to, how to uh, increase their um, cushion of time to be able to get research done. Like, I plan way in advance. When I have to do an NIH renewal, I start a year early. If you talk to some PhDs, they're like, oh, three months, you know? But I can't do that because if I'm on call, and a patient has a problem, I have to take care of that patient. So if I plan to work on something during a period of time, and I have a clinical responsibility, I've got to take care of the clinical responsibility. So it's helpful to work with a, an MD as well. And they talk about this concept, I like this, the board of trustees. These are people that you trust. And sometimes when you say, oh, will you be my mentor, the, you know, in, in the, mentor's mind, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time. How could I be a mentor? What's your project? You know, and they, they, they in their mind, think that, that it's a lot of work. But you can just say, hey, do you have time to go out for coffee? Or, you know, could we just go and talk for a little while? I want to pick your brain. I want to get your ideas on this. And you just talk to them. It's free. And most of the time, people, especially, you know, there's clinician scientists who are like a network. You're, you know, you can find them everywhere. But most of the time, people are going to be very happy to have you ask their advice. So don't forget that. You, you can do that. And those are people that you just, you know, pick up the phone and periodically talk to. Or, I mean, you have to, you have to do it in a way that it's easy for them. So, like, I have a board of trustees. And some of them are now people who mentored me during the time that I was an uh, early faculty member. And so I try to meet up with them, like in meetings. You know, we're in different cities. and I mean, if I really needed their help, I could set up a phone meeting. But I just try to talk to them periodically. Um, and, and I use the time to be able to get, you know, career advice. Uh, and, and don't forget your mentors. So. Um, you know, when they talk about, you know, their pre they have all these names, right? I, I, I guess I'm talking about people that you can trust, that you can talk to about your career and about your science and about your clinical, you know, what you want to do. Um, 
the, when they talk about mentorship, there is supposed to be that at some point in your life you're going to, your mentors, there's like a mutual interaction. And there may be. It doesn't have to be, you know. But on the other hand, don't forget your mentors. I mean, I think people who teach are often, who are really dedicated to teaching, are often, like, you know, they feel unappreciated. It's getting better now because a academic institutes are actually recognizing that teaching is important and there are promotions and all that stuff for teaching, but for a long time it wasn't always like that. Um, there, you know, some of the, the programs will talk about the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. So, um, and I'm not sure I quite understand that. I don't know that I've had sponsors, but sponsors are supposed to be people that you can go to and say, hey, could you uh, support me for some award or some uh, course or some promotion? I mean, I guess I've been a sponsor to people because I get asked a lot of times to write promotion letters, for example. But it's, it's not, it's more that I've been asked through academic institutes and not necessarily from that person. But that's another thing that think about uh, m moving forward in your career. Okay, let me see here. I think we're just about done. Let me go through pearls. Yeah, so, uh, you know, my, the, the pearls I would say, you know, as you develop your career as a clinician scientist, and you may, you may also say, you know what, I don't want to do basic science, but that's okay. You can still be evidence-based, right, for your patients. But a but couple things, timelines vary. So <clears throat> you, um, you know, you're a resident, or say you're a resident um, or a fellow, and you're, you're really busy clinically, and you want to be involved in research, but you don't have the time. That's okay. Your, your goal now is really to be clinical, <laughs> to learn everything you can clinically. And, and, but if you can get involved in research or you can continue thinking as, uh, of scientific rigor during journal clubs or as you read the literature and that, you know, you can always look in PubMed when you've got a patient that has some kind of strange disease. You're like, I don't know what this is. Why is this happening? You can do that, that research and start to to be more, to get to gather more information about it. So you don't have to necessarily be thinking about a KOA grant when you're a resident or a fellow. So timeline's different. You can't do everything all at once. You may be working, you may be um, focused on your family, for example. <coughs> That's important. You should enjoy that as part of what you do. You know, it's like, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe I don't quite understand the work-life balance thing because so many times I have people say, oh, well, I've got to make sure that I have time here to be able to spend with my family, and I've got this time, and it's like, well, it's, if you can, it's so stressful, right? If you can think of it that this is, a, this is part of who you are as a physician, right? Who you are in trying to provide the best evidence-based care for your patients, right? So, so this is part of you. This is part of life and how you approach life. So you don't, you, you know, don't, don't worry about segmenting. If, you're, if your children need your, your uh, attention, then give them your attention. But you can still be involved in research. You can still do it through your mentality and the, and the day to day. Help them do an, a science project. You're involved in research, right, designing. Uh, enjoy what you do. And remember, though, timelines, Time does move rapidly, so it's very helpful to have plans. And there are independent development plans, individual development plans, I think they're called. So you can, I don't know if you're, probably you're already doing that with Jeff and that, I don't know. But you can, there are, you know, where you just write down what your plan, what you want to be able to do in various aspects of your life. And it might be your personal and your social and your research and your academic and your clinical and goals that you want to be able to accomplish. And think of it in short-term goals and long-term goals. And the, the reason this is so valuable is because after you look at it a year later, you're going to realize you did a lot more than you thought you did. You know, how many times 
I, so I have to do it for NIH for my grants. I have to write, you know, I have my aims and I have to say what we did each year. And I'm thinking, oh, we didn't do anything on this grant, you know, when I'm getting ready to write it up. But then I look back at what the last plan was and I think, oh my gosh, we have, we've got three papers out. Oh, oh we found this. Oh, and we're moving in this direction. So it's, it's very helpful to do that. So I encourage you, whatever you want to call it. People t used to tell me that it was a, uh, just a five-year plan, but I encourage you to do that. And I can give you examples if you don't have it. So that's really all I have. And um, does anyone have any questions or anything else you want to talk about? Okay. Thank you for your attention. I think it's like 8 o'clock, so you're on time. Thank you.